This is a story of the eradication of free speech through our legal justice system. This specific tale takes place in the polite and peaceful land of Canada, a place that presents the image of inclusivity and of treating all its citizens equally. Yet, this is a country that silences you if you may have hurt someone's feelings or reputation. In fact, there's a chance that I will be slapped with a lawsuit for simply covering this story as an independent journalist. And I say this not to be dramatic, but because someone else who covered this story before I did was threatened with legal action. Our tale begins in Canada's capital, at the University of Ottawa. Back in 2008, the Student Appeal Center of the University went to the president, Alan Rock, because they noticed that the majority of students that went to them for advice after being accused of academic fraud were visible minorities. Alan Rock did not respond to their concerns, so they put together an official report. The report seemed to have reaffirmed their initial concerns that there is blatant discrimination against visible minorities in terms of things like academic fraud and plagiarism. So Alan Rock decided to intervene at this point. Alan Rock asked Joanne St. Louis, a black law professor at the university, to review the report and give an independent opinion of whether it was credible or not. Seems like an appropriate thing to do, right? The Student Appeal Center claims systemic racism at the university, so he asks a black woman to review the report. Well, not quite. First of all, there's an immediate conflict of interest since Joanne St. Louis works for and is paid by the University of Ottawa. Secondly, what normally happens to reports of this nature is they are first reviewed by the academic departments where the report originated from, then they move up to the faculty level, then they are submitted to a committee. In this case, this very normal process was thrown out for some reason. So what happens next is Joanne St. Louis does what she calls an independent review of the Student Appeal Center report and publicly states that the report has significant methodological errors. The situation had become high profile, gaining a lot of bad publicity for the university. So having Joanne St. Louis, a black female professor, discredit the report and say that it was highly unsubstantiated was great for the University of Ottawa. Fair enough. Naturally, a black professor at the university, a visible minority herself, would want what is best for her students, right? People make accusations of racism all the time, so it's awesome that she reviewed the report and concluded that it was flawed and that the university does not target minorities when it comes to uh, plagiarism. Everybody wins, let's go home. Not quite. The Student Appeal Center would not have that. They still believed that there was injustice at the university. Okay, fine, prove it, right? Right, so they filed a request under the Freedom of Information Act to obtain all communications that had to do with the center. This included uh, exchanges between Alan Rock and St. Louis. When people read these exchanges, it became apparent to many that Alan Rock handpicked Joanne St. Louis in order to uh, dissolve any bad publicity that the university gained from the Student Appeal Center report. Ouch. So now more people start to get involved. It's not just some media frenzy that's probably um, you know overblown. People at the university themselves started to care because you know they have an investment in this institution. One of these people was a black student named Hazel Gashoka. She looked at all of the reports and all of the communication herself and became very concerned and tried to contact St. Louis to just have a one-on-one -on -one and really get what's going on here. St. Louis never met with her. Meanwhile, a 10-year physics prof named Dennis Rancourt also became interested in this report. Like Hazel, he took the time to review all the information made public in terms of this uh, debacle and posted his opinion on his blog. Now this blog post became the subject of a defamation lawsuit against Rancourt by the University of Ottawa. Fun defamation fact. 
companies have successfully sued Google for unfavorable search results. A lawsuit that Alan Rock stated would have no cap in terms of funding and has cost the university over a million dollars. This lawsuit led to Rancourt's firing, has completely destroyed his financial standing and reputation, and has plagued his life for five long years. Why? Well, because Dennis Rancourt had the audacity to speak the truth. So what horrendous thing did this blog post state? I'll let Hazel illustrate it for you. I also heard about a blog post by Professor Denis Rancourt, um, whereby he said that this professor, Professor St. Louis, was acting as Alan Rock's house negro. Now, I know the initial knee-jerk reaction from pe some people of color was, wow, wow, how could, how dare this professor say this? Um, but I think we need to stop and think. I think we need to stop just looking at the surface and we really need to see things for what they are. Because, in my opinion, I would say that Joanne St. Louis acted as Alan Rock's house negro. If you look at the definition of what a house negro is, Joanne St. Louis met the terms um, that characterize that definition as, as told by Malcolm X. So what it was is that she, as a black collaborator, was working with the master, right, to literally to, to pull the wool over the eyes of the people of color to satisfy them and tell them. So as a representative of the community, she was there to tell them that, no, this is not the case. Everything is fine and dandy which is what House Negroes do. His approach was to expose the university for their corruption and their systemic racism and say, look, you know, you guys are a racist institution. You know, this is what you've been doing. These are your practices and, and forcing them to acknowledge that. So I think that is more of an anti-racist approach, although it's done by a white man as opposed to this black professor who purports to be an anti-racist activist. She, what she did was she made sure that the you know, that the wheels stay in motion. And as a black face, you know, you feel much more comfortable hearing that from her because she's reassuring the masses that, no, it's fine, you know, everything's working well, um, when, in, when in fact it's not. For those of you unfamiliar with the term house negro, it's a historic term that's quite consistent in meaning and was very well defined by Malcolm X in one of his speeches. And this speech was posted, uh, embedded in Dennis Rancourt's blog post just to eliminate any confusion. And I'm just gonna play it for you now. There were two kinds of Negroes. There was that old house Negro and the field Negro. And the house Negro always looked out for his master. When the field Negroes got too much out of line, he held them back in check. He ate better, he dressed better, and he lived in a better house. He lived right up next to his master in the attic or the basement. And he loved his master more than his master loved himself. That's why he didn't want his master hurt. If the master got sick, he'd say, what's the matter, boss? We sick. He was as sick as the master. Another very interesting person who got involved is Cynthia McKinney, who was the first African-American woman to represent Georgia in the U.S. House of Representatives in the Congress. Cynthia McKinney started a petition which gained over a thousand signatures to give Dennis Rancourt a fair trial. She stated, I'm standing up for a professor who stood up for the University of Ottawa students and then got fired for doing so. She also wrote a detailed document which outlines the historic definition of the term and the specific criteria that St. Louis met in order to be appropriately called what Dennis Rancourt called her. This is from her document. First, there must be an invitation by the master to enter the house and also to serve the master. If it is not by invitation, then it cannot be a house Negro situation. Second, there must be a need for a black face. The master has an advantage of using a black servant for the task at hand. Third, 
The black servant typically does what is requested irrespective of his or her training or experience for the task at hand and to the detriment of the people who look like him or her. McKinney goes on to detail exactly how the term was appropriately used in the case of St. Louis. You can read the whole report below, it's linked. Unfortunately, logic fails in the name of institutionalized interests, and letter and trigger words are like bullets to the heart of true justice. The defamation lawsuit went on, and the trial was astonishingly biased. The jury was not allowed to see a transcript or the video of Malcolm X's definition of house negro. How can you sue someone over what was stated in a blog post and not show the entire blog post as evidence? And actually, legally, you can't. By law, in a defamation lawsuit, you're supposed to see the entire thing that is apparently defaming the person. That includes sign language, uh, audience reaction, speech, transcript, video, uh, theater performance. The whole thing must be shown. At the end, they actually went as far as to say that Dennis Rancourt didn't request for the video to be shown, which goes against reality, which the transcripts actually support. The transcripts of the trial are also linked below if you have time to be even more outraged. He was also not allowed to use the fair comment defense, which states that if it's in the interest of the public and an opinion based on fact, then it's not defamation. So here's this giant lawsuit with no financial cap, which is presented as a private lawsuit, but is actually funded by public funds taken from the University of Ottawa, personally approved by Alan Rock. And here's Dennis Rancourt, a professor who has no job now, uh, self-representing with really no access to finances. A couple other crazy things. The two prosecution lawyers against Dennis Rancourt have in the past represented Canadian prime ministers. The first judge he had had a scholarship program in the name of his dead son at the University of Ottawa. When Rancourt found out and brought this up as a conflict of interest, the judge threatened him with contempt of court, which basically means jail time. But Rancourt kept asking the judge to recuse himself because of this conflict of interest. So eventually the judge threw a hissy fit and ran out of the courtroom, which you can read in the transcript as well, and came back saying that he will recuse himself, but not because there's a conflict of interest, but because he was disgusted with Rancourt bringing the subject up. Because of the way the judge recused himself, none of his bad rulings that uh, happened prior were demolished. They were left standing. The replacement judge had all of his degrees from the University of Ottawa and was a yearly donor. At the end of the day, there was zero evidence presented that would show that St. Louis's reputation was hurt. There was zero measurable impact on her professional life, but that actually doesn't matter because in this archaic law of defamation, all you have to do is show the jury that uh, the comment that was made could tend to reduce the opinion of a person in public view. No actual evidence is necessary. The damage is presumed. Wow. What an effective mechanism for controlling society. I'm gonna keep that one in my mind for the glory days of my dictatorship. So naturally, Dennis Rancourt lost and he's being charged with paying for the other side's trial expenses, which is hundreds of thousands of dollars and is actually unconstitutional. It is a chill on freedom of expression according to the International Covenant of Civil and Political Rights which is above common law. It is international law. In his appeal, he presented this fact and they just kind of ignored it. So this is where Dennis is at now. Fired, financially ruined, bullied, and his freedom of speech has literally been taken away. He is under the threat of jail 
for things that he may eventually say, which is called a gag of unknown statements. Because he had no money to pay the damages ordered against him. So because he's not rich, his free speech was taken away. I think that's called fascism. The funny thing is, this wasn't about money. They knew that he didn't have any money going into it. This was solely about silencing him. Welcome to our brave new world. People have a social narrative dictated by the government to them and they've absorbed it and internalized it and then they externalize it to their audience like a performer on stage.